We've been told the same thing for decades now. Limit your salt intake to lower your risk of health problems like high blood pressure, heart attack, and stroke. But is salt really the villain that it's made out to be? Personally, I've been seeing improvements in my energy and focus with an increase in my salt intake. Stick till the end for more of my personal experience with salt and for details about how I make sure to get enough electrolytes and sodium each day, uh, at least for me. As with all of my videos, I'm just a normal person trying to make sense out of the information that's out there, and this video is in no way giving any sort of advice whatsoever. Salt is a necessary ingredient for several processes in our bodies and brains. It is linked directly with our magnesium, potassium, and calcium levels, so we need a sufficient amount of it to stay healthy. In fact, getting too little can have adverse effects. So where did the idea that too much salt is bad even come from? It all goes back to a French study in 1904 in which six participants found to have high blood pressure, an indicator of heart disease, were described as salt fiends. The idea that salt causes hypertension, or high blood pressure, was further pushed in the 1970s when Louis Dahl found that by feeding rats salt, he was able to give them hypertension. Dahl claimed that the study found unequivocal evidence that salt causes hypertension. One of the main problems with the study, though, was that the rats were fed the human equivalent of 500 grams of sodium per day. For comparison, the recommended sodium intake per day is 2.3 grams, but average Americans consume about 3.4 grams per day. Basically, you'd have to eat most of a container of salt per day to match what Dahl was feeding the rats in his study. As time went by, studies popped up that conflicted with this idea that salt is the cause of high blood pressure. A 1988 study called InterSalt found that the participants that ate the most salt in the study, about 14 grams per day, had a lower median blood pressure than the participants that ate the least, which was about 7.2 grams per day. But there are definitely cases where salt might cause high blood pressure. PhD researcher Dr. D. Nicolantonio explains. Two requirements had to be met for someone to actually have a rise in blood pressure eating a normal salt diet. One, you had to be genetically susceptible. Two, you had to eat a low potassium diet. Okay, and, and if you didn't have those two requirements met, you didn't get any significant rise in blood pressure when you ate salt. Unfortunately, those, those nuances didn't translate into the dietary goals because, you know what? Complicated messages don't make for good dietary guidelines. So high blood pressure and salt at the very least requires a genetic predisposition and a diet that's low in potassium. An article in Scientific American from 2011 actually states that the studies found that low salt diets only minimally lowered blood pressure and concluded there is little evidence for long-term benefit from reducing salt intake. And likewise, Andrew Huberman recently reviewed studies on his podcast that showed increasing salt in people who don't already have hypertension can improve health outcomes. Get too little salt, your health can decline, but if you get too much salt, it might put you at risk. But what is this, and why does too little salt increase our chances of having poor health? One way that consuming too little salt can impact your health is actually by increasing your heart rate, which might be a higher risk factor for heart disease. So what about elevated heart rates versus blood, elevated blood pressure as a marker for heart disease or as a risk for heart disease. Yeah, so basically um, when you look at the actual, what happens to let's say someone with normal blood pressure and they cut their salt intake, they get about a 1% reduction in blood pressure, but they actually get about a five to 10% increase in heart rate. So when you multiply heart rate times blood pressure, that's what's giving you the overall stress on the heart and the arteries. And when you multiply the two, it's always significantly worse on a low salt diet. So by cutting your salt, you might lower your blood pressure a, a few points, but you're going to raise your resting heart rate, which when you do the math actually turns out to be a higher risk factor for, for heart disease. Exactly. In addition to increasing your heart rate, consuming a diet too low in salt can also negatively affect how magnesium and potassium are regulated in your body. A key piece of the puzzle that a lot of people are missing is that salt literally controls your magnesium status. And because it does that, it controls your potassium and your calcium status. And what I mean by that is if you aren't getting enough salt, your body will start pulling sodium from the bone to maintain a normal level. And it will also strip magnesium and calcium from the bone at the same time. And what that actually ends up doing is the spikes in magnesium and calcium from your low salt diet tricks your body into thinking you have too much magnesium and calcium and you stop absorbing it well and you start kicking more out. The second thing that happens is to conserve sodium, your body starts sweating out more magnesium and more calcium. And the third thing is aldosterone rises and that hormone kicks out more magnesium in the urine. So literally the worst thing you can do for your magnesium status is to not get enough salt. That's a, I really want people to understand that. 
It sounds like we really don't want to be in a place where we're consuming too little sodium. One of the main problems with the debate around salt intake is that it's attempting to isolate something, in this case sodium, in a complex system and pin it as one of the main causes of hypertension. This is problematic because we exist in a food environment that's filled with so many things that some would say we might not want to be eating, such as highly processed foods, carbohydrates, sugar, additives, preservatives, stabilizers, emulsifiers, fillers, coloring agents, pesticides, herbicides, and a number of other ingredients that could potentially contribute to any number of health conditions. Not to mention there's already a ton of salt added to most processed foods for flavoring, shelf life, or even texture. So limiting or eliminating processed foods might help, but even going keto or carnivore might require us to keep a close eye on our sodium intake. Andrew Huberman illustrates what we eat impacts how much salt we need to consume. Personally, these days I eat a primarily carnivore diet, but I'm not really strict about it. Some weeks I'll have some fruit, mostly apples or oranges, and some weeks I'll have some white rice or something like that. But in general, I've been finding that increasing my sodium intake has had a positive effect on my energy levels and my focus. This is my personal preference, and what's been working for me is uh, making this electrolyte drink that has reverse osmosis water, lemon juice, honey, and salt. It's sort of a no additives version of a sports drink, and it's really been doing wonders for me. Uh, I mix about 900 milliliters, or about four cups, of water with juice from one whole lemon. Don't buy lemon juice, because most of the time it has preservatives, and it tastes way more acidic than squeezing a lemon. Then I put one and a half teaspoons of salt with one to two tablespoons of honey, preferably raw honey, if you have access to it. Um, and then you just put it all in a bottle shake it up and add more salt if it's not salty enough for you or dilute with more water if it tastes a bit too salty. Um, and you can put less or more honey depending on your personal preference. Also, I'm not chugging this stuff either. I'm having maybe one or two cups a day. Some people prefer electrolyte supplements. I don't really like going the supplement route, but lemon juice has some potassium, magnesium, and calcium, and I've noticed really positive results after I started drinking it. It's worth noting that lemons can cause your body to release histamine. So if you are on a low histamine diet or if you have pretty sensitive allergies, you might want to try an electrolyte supplement instead of this electrolyte drink. So it's also important to consider that caffeine medications or some supplements might actually decrease your sodium levels. There's really a lot to consider when trying to figure out how much sodium you yourself might require per day. It's definitely worth asking your doctor about. So the main takeaway is that the issue of salt consumption in diet is really, really nuanced. Some of us need more salt, some of us need less, but there are potential hazards for having too little or way too much, especially if you already have hypertension. A lot of it depends on body composition, diet, and exercise. Magnesium and potassium are also important to consider and are negatively impacted if we don't have enough sodium. Sodium intake seems like the ideal candidate for a subject that can't be polarized or split into teams because everyone has different needs. And what's different about looking at salt compared to raw milk, seed oils, or something like the lean mass hyperresponder studies is that there is a lot of data playing both sides of the field. Some studies say that salt's bad for you, some say that it's not, and our bodies actually do need adequate salt to function. So it's really confusing to wade through all the information and try to figure out how much we need. But what do you think? Have you ever tried a low sodium diet or tried increasing your sodium intake? What kinds of effects did you feel after making the change? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this video interesting or learned something new, please share it with a friend, like, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and being part of the conversation. Take care.